Elections will come to order. The clerk will call the roll. Chair Kane. Present. Vice Chair Gonzalez. Beckley. Present. Busey. Here. Clardy. Fierro. Jatan. Here. Schofield. Swanson. Here. A quorum is present. Good morning, members. Let's begin with some housekeeping items. We're going to take up bills by non-committee members first. The author is present, and then move to bills of committee members. As a reminder, if there's anyone who wishes to testify on any of the bills we are hearing today, you must register on the electronic kiosk outside of the witness room before you testify and indicate which bills you're uh, here to testify on. Please, 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 please make sure to finish and submit this form. If you do not properly register on the kiosk, the rules will not allow you to testify. We'll be limiting public testimony to two minutes today. When you first hear the timer go off, you have 15 seconds left to close your testimony. Also, if you do not wish to testify in person today, you can leave written public testimony comments through our website on any agenda item. We are hearing today until the, uh, the hearing is adjourned. Also remind you, uh, that at, at some point uh, before 10 a.m. this morning, um, we will be we'll be leaving for the floor and and coming back uh, later today. The chair lays out House Bill 1463 and recognizes Representative Goodwin to explain the bill. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and members. Texas Election Code Section 82002 allows eligible people to vote by mail for any of five reasons. Absence from the county, being over 65, detention in jail, participation in the address confidentiality program, or disability. The last category is broad and a bit vague. Voters qualify to vote by mail because of a disability if they have any sickness or physical condition that prevents the voter from appearing at the polling place on election day. Other than that, there is only one specific condition mentioned in the section of code related to this issue, expected or likely confinement for childbirth on election day. This language is as old as the election code itself adopted by the 68th Texas legislature in 1985. Indeed, the word confinement has a somewhat old fashioned ring. It suggests a mother or soon to be mother being unable to leave the bed because the birth of her baby was in the very immediate past or will be in the very immediate future. Thus, the current statute specifically guarantees the ability to vote by mail only to those who will know weeks in advance that they are going to deliver a baby within a day or two of the election. This provision for pregnant voters should be brought into the 21st century. Pregnancy can be a complicated, can be complicated and unpredictable. The delivery does not always fall on the expected due date. Some pregnancies bring complications and some mothers to be <clears throat> are more mobile than others. After birth, mothers can be hospitalized for days or weeks and may not be ready to stand in lines newborns have vulnerable immune systems and the polling place may not be the safest location for them. For these reasons, the current law should be given a minor update. My bill, House Bill 1463, would change one sentence in the code. Rather than allowing vote by mail only for expected or likely confinement, it would extend that ability to a voter giving birth or expecting to give birth within nine months of election day. The legislature has already decided to allow pregnant voters to cast their ballots by mail. This small change would only clarify our intent and modernize the implementation of this provision. I ask for the support of the committee, Mr. Chairman, and uh, would ask for the right to close. Thank you. Turn on your mic. Yes. <laughs> I'd ask. It, it, did any of the members have any questions for Representative Gibbon? None? Okay. Uh, chair calls Susanna Carranza. Hi, Ms. Carranza, I've got you. Susanna Carranza here on behalf of yourself and you are for this bill. Is that correct? Yes. Please. I had uh, just. Very quickly, thank you uh, for proposing this bill. It's a simple clarification, but anything that makes things easier for mothers, especially that they're already juggling a lot, 
it's a great thing to do. Just because they're pregnant doesn't mean that they can't vote. Anybody has any questions? Perfect. Thank you, members. Thanks Thank so much. You. Good morning. Chair calls Robert Green. Good morning, sir. I've got you as Robert L. Green here back for the Travis County Republican Party Election Integrity Committee and yourself, and you are against this bill. Is that correct? That is correct. Please proceed. Uh, there is a problem with the bill. I read it two or three times, and it would seem to permit this mail-in ballot application to be from the moment the person identifies the fact that they are pregnant to actually to nine months beyond the birth of the child. And if the I read it over and over again, and it seems to permit that, that you would be able to have a mail-in ballot at any time, say, after the, after the birth of the child as well, up to nine months further. So I would, I would say that the bill definitely needs some clarification. I think that the period of time should definitely be much shorter. So, yes, I'm, I'm not in favor of it. Everybody should read that bill carefully. I did. Any questions? Members, any questions for this witness? None. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Chair calls Diana Weiss. It's uh, Weiss, but Weiss. <laughs> close. W-E-I-H-S. Yes. Good morning, ma'am. I've got you as Diana Weiss here on behalf of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the Texas Association of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and you are for this bill. Is that correct? That is correct. Please proceed. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Kane and representatives for uh, letting me speak. I'm a recently retired OBGYN in Austin with over 40 years of clinical experience. I have worked uh, with thousands of pregnant women um, and care deeply about women's health care. Um, I'm representing ACOG and, and Texas Association of OBGYN, as you mentioned. Um, no pregnant woman should be subjected to the undue burden of standing for long periods of time. In fact, in recommendations about work, that's the, the most dangerous part of pregnancy. Uh, House Bill 1463 would provide alternatives to voting for a pregnant woman and postpartum when they're caring for an infant in the most reliable way uh, to guarantee health and safety of most women. Um, Working during pregnancy is safe, but again, working uh, that uh, involves prolonged standing is usually all modified during pregnancy. ACOG believes certain accommodations as it relates to voting can also be made to all pregnant women in the interest of ensuring the health of safety of the mother and baby during the pregnancy and during the postpartum period. In closing, ACOG supports the legislation that maximizes comfort and ability to main vote in a safe and convenient manner and as written, I, we believe that's what HB 1463 we would do. Thank you so much for allowing me to testify. Any questions? Yes, you have some. Chair recognized for Yes, the chair recognizes Representative Busey. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Dr. Weiss, thank you for being here. I agree with you fully. Can you talk about a little bit how it's so unknown from one woman to the next what complications could arise, so why this is such a stopgap safety to make sure their rights to the ballot box are protected? Right. I mean, one reason I, uh, I mean, that obstetrics taught me is how completely unpredictable it is early pregnancy, threatened miscarriage, bleeding um, could be exacerbated. People develop severe high blood pressure, sometimes very early in pregnancy. They have uh, something called a placenta previa that requires bed rest at home. There are so many possibilities. And then I think extending it into the postpartum period is really reasonable when a uh, mom is home with an infant uh, to, to get to the ballot, uh, to get to the polling place on election day with a child, it seems to me, with an infant, seems to me unreasonable. It should be extended. I agree. Let me ask you this. So 
the naysayers will say, well, just go and vote or do what you need to do and make it work because they've probably never been a pregnant person and, and thought through that process. But could, if someone was planning to go vote in person, let's say they're pregnant, they were planning to do that, and then three weeks out or the day before early voting or in early voting, it, on a dime, something could change for someone that's pregnant, right? Absolutely. And now their plans have been disrupted. We know that this isn't just the rarity of every given person having a health problem. This can happen, and it happens, and you see it all the time, right? Absolutely. So to protect this right to the ballot box, this is a safeguard that we should give to all pregnant people, in my opinion. I feel, I feel strongly about it, as does ACOG. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Any... Chair recognizes Representative Beckley. So thank you. Um, can we talk about the time frame a little bit and can we address that? So I mean, so from the time you, you find out you're pregnant, but you, anything can happen, I think we kind of know that. And, um, you know, I've, I've had friends that, you know, they go in, they've had right. premature babies and they don't, you know, know for, you don't know when that's going to happen because right. that, that doesn't happen on a, you know, people who right. don't even know they have anything going on. Okay, so, and then the nine months after, can we talk about why that's so important for nine months after? Well, I think postpartum, mm -hmm. certainly complications can happen, uh, you know, hemorrhage, many, uh, major surgery, a C-section, um, and then the difficulty of jugg juggling breastfeeding and infant care and not knowing what's going to happen with the baby during yeah. that time period, it seems quite mm -hmm. reasonable to and me then, for it to extend postpartum. And then, uh, so the immune system of the baby is probably not real. So being around all right. the people, the baby it's not usually suggested that you get right. that as well. Thank you. I think it would be disruptive of the polling place. Too, oh well, there's that. Have, there's that as well. Have a baby all kinds of, and all yeah. Do you for, do we have a breastfeeding area? And, you know, if somebody wants a little privacy, yeah. So we don't have to deal with all that. Okay. Thank you very much. Members, any other questions? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Members, would you like to hear from the Secretary of State's office? Hearing none, okay. <laughs> All right. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on for or against House Bill 1463? If not, the chair recognizes Representative Goodwin to close on the bill. Uh, and please let the record show that Representative Schofield present. Thank you, Chairman and members. Uh, I take the right to vote very seriously. My parents brought me up that way. I would say I have probably voted in every election since I've become eligible, except potentially after my kids were born. I had a, a my, my last daughter was born October 31st. And um, I think that was the one time when I had the biggest challenge making it to the polling location. I think this would be very helpful for many women who are either pregnant or have just given birth. And I would love to extend this opportunity for them to be able to vote by mail. And with that, I close. Thank you, Representative Goodwin. Members, any questions? Thank you, ma'am. If there is no objection, the bill will be left pending. Is there objection? The chair hears none, and the bill is left pending. Let's let the record reflect that Representative Clardy is now present. The chair lays out House Bill 3424 and recognizes Representative Slauson to explain the bill. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm here laying out HB 3424, which just very simply creates a civil liability option for people who have engaged in organized election fraud in connection with an election in this state. I will yield for your questions if you have any this morning, and I would respectfully reserve the right to close. Yes, of course. Members, any questions for this, for the author? All right. We'll be bring you back up after witnesses. Okay. Thank you. The chair calls James Slattery. Good morning, Ms. Slattery. I've got you as James Slattery, senior staff attorney for the Texas Civil Rights Project, and you were not for this bill. That's so, right. All right, you're against. All right, good. <clears throat> Please proceed. 
Section 1 would take the already existing criminal offense of organized election fraud activity and allow the state's top prosecutor to now sue defendants in civil court for the same offense. By doing so, it would allow him to use the civil court system to do an end run around the procedural safeguards that exist in the criminal justice system and protect defendants from wrongful judgments and governmental abuse of power. The new civil cause of action would have the exact same elements as the criminal offense, but unlike the criminal statute where a prosecutor must prove the elements of the offense beyond a reasonable doubt, this bill would allow the attorney general to obtain punishment of defendants for the same conduct by satisfying only the sharply lower standard of a preponderance of the evidence. That punishment is itself quasi-criminal in nature, a $1,000 penalty for each offense that is clearly intended to quickly drive defendants into bankruptcy. Further, unlike in criminal cases where a defendant has the right to counsel even if they cannot afford one, that right does not exist in civil proceedings. Having defendants face the power of the state in court alone without a lawyer makes it substantially more likely that the attorney general will obtain an adverse judgment even if the defendant did not in fact commit the offense. And such a prospect will give enormous leverage to the attorney general to squeeze settlement agreements out of vulnerable and innocent defendants just to make the case go away and avoid financial ruin. The safeguards of our criminal justice system exist to balance the needs of justice with the need to protect individuals from the arbitrary exercise of governmental power. We should not give the attorney general the authority to sidestep those guardrails merely because they may sometimes be inconvenient. We therefore urge the committee not to report this bill favorably. Chair sure recognizes Vice Chair Gonzalez. Hi, good morning. Um, can you, uh, just for the, uh, I guess, non-lawyers on the committee, can you explain the different uh, standards of proof and, yep. and what the differences are, please? Sure. Uh, preponderance of the evidence is a little bit easier to explain. Basically, it just means, is it even slightly more likely than not that a person committed an offense? Basically, is it 50.1% likely that this person did the thing that they are alleged to have done? beyond a reasonable doubt is a substantially higher standard that, uh, you know, I think legal philosophers have struggled to define for centuries, but it's basically, you know, do you feel comfortable putting this person in prison? Uh, and it has to satisfy, I mean, that's not the legal standard, but it, it's, it's, those are the stakes. And so it's substantially higher. Members, any other questions for this witness? Thanks, sir. Thank you. The chair calls Alan Vera. Good morning, Mr. Vera. Got you, Alan Vera. Chairman, Harris County Republican Party Ballot Security Committee. That's who you're here on behalf of, and you are for this bill. Is that correct? That's all correct. Please proceed. This bill addresses a real and growing problem in Texas elections, organized election fraud. And in the cases we're now pursuing in Harris County, the overwhelming majority of the victims are people of color, voters of color. I can't give you the names and details. This is about to become an open investigation, but I'll give you a summary. 130 mail ballot applications submitted to the Harris County clerk in a single envelope ballot harvesting. 120 of the applications in the single envelope had no witness signature. As you know, it's illegal to send in a ballot by mail application for another person unless you sign as a witness. Four of the ballot by mail applications submitted were for voters who had died at least 10 years prior to the date the mail ballots were sent in. Comparing the voter signatures on the applications to the same voter signatures in recently filed property transactions shows a very high percentage of the signatures are not signatures of the voter, nowhere close. Using the database public data, it's clear the majority of these voters who have been victimized by this action are voters of color. The three individuals whose names are all in violation of this particular issue were all paid by the same campaign at the time the election, these, this action was taken. This is organized election fraud activity. It is the subject of this bill. And all the bill does is give us a civil course of action in the event that the criminal course of action is not available. We recommend you refer this bill favorably to the full house as quickly as possible. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Vera. Members, any questions? Thanks, sir. Chair, I call it Robert Green. Good morning, Sarah Gutchins. Robert L. Green here on behalf of the Travis County Republican Party Election Integrity Committee and yourself, and you are for this bill. Is that correct? That is correct. Please proceed. Mr. Vera covered most of the stuff that I was going to talk about, but I, I always want to talk about the, the key word in, in here down in Section G, organized election fraud. This is not just a case of an individual maybe submitting one or two ballots. This has to do with people, as he mentioned, the case of 130 ballots coming in in a single envelope. That is organized, and it deserves to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. I mean, you, you want to say, if you can't pay the fine, don't do the crime. They used to say, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. But in this case, I think it's, I think it's important that, that people realize that the importance of accurate elections and that the public feel confident that the results of the election are proper and, and, and secure. So I, I, I think that it is important. I think uh, a fine like this would certainly discourage people from, from doing the things that they really shouldn't be doing and getting together with others to conspire to do them, because that's what organized means. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Chair, organized representative BC. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, Mr. Green, we have criminal safeguards here. If we hear every week in this committee about so much rampant voter fraud, why is the criminal court not good enough to get it done? I think that it's because it takes too much time and it's, it becomes a, essentially a burden on the court to be able to, to file all these criminal prosecutions. We've got, we have got a situation where our courts are filled up with all sorts of other stuff, be it family code information or other things in our district courts. But And so this, this would give us an, an option to go outside of the, the criminal area and actually create a, create a fine for doing the things we know shouldn't be done. It just seems to me, based on the attention that's given to quote-unquote voter fraud in this state and in the national level and in this committee and how much time it's taken up uh, dealing with what apparently there's a lot of evidence, but we never see it, um, I'm just curious why, if it's so rampant, the criminal courts aren't the proper authority for this. And and why we're not seeing that evidence if it's so common, let's keep it where it should be, which is criminal. Let's keep it at the high standard. If there are bad actors at that high standard, let's punish them. But until we see the proof, I don't know why we want to lower the threshold because we can't get the proof and we can't win our cases to deal with this fake narrative. So now we're going to bring it down to a lower level? That just doesn't make sense to me. Once we have again, the safeguards in place right now. The safeguards are in place, but once again, we, we talked about earlier, we talked about the that it had to be beyond a reasonable doubt to show a, a criminal offense. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, you know, there's a there's a something in, in between beyond a reasonable doubt and a preponderance of the evidence. He talked about 50 percent or uh, being 50.1 percent being sufficient to get a preponderance of evidence, but you require a heck of a lot more to actually get to the case sure. of a criminal situation. But we're talking it's about... an option. I agree with you, but we're talking about safeguards around protecting our democracy, and I think a high level should be the standard well, when we're talking about protecting Let's them. also consider from the national level, uh, I've, and I've said it before, that we do not need any parts, not even pieces parts of H.R. 1 in any law in Texas. We don't want what happens in other states to ever be able to happen here. Well, on that we disagree, sir, but thank you for well, answering my questions. You're welcome. Members, any other questions for this witness? The chair recognizes Representative Schofield. Mr. Green. Oh. Sorry. First of I all, I didn't see I, you raise your hand. I will definitely carry to my other committee, Judiciary and Civil Jurisprudence, uh, Mr. Busey's idea that if there's a criminal penalty, we don't need to be having private lawsuits. On oh, the same okay. issue. So I'm sure the Trial Lawyers Association will be happy. They to will, hear yeah, that. they'll jump all over that. Uh, but I also I agree with Mr. Busey that that our democracy is our highest uh, measure that we need to protect, and I think that I have the opposite uh, view of it from him that if we really value voting, then we make, need to make darn sure that people who are organizing to commit fraud in elections are going to be taken care of, whether it's criminally, civilly, or whatever tool you need. 
everybody's vote needs to count. I agree. And if Every their vote, vote is, must count. If their vote's offset by a fraudulent vote, they have not had the right to vote. That's They've right. had the right to think they voted. Yeah. And but I, I don't see that there's any reason they got to pull out of the hands. <laughs> but let me ask you this. Sir. Uh, you're from Travis County. I'm from Harris County. So we have different, you know, we're 150 miles apart. And there are 254 counties in the state. If the district attorney is of the same county of the people cheating, what incentive does the district attorney have to press charges? Wow. Um, actually, they have a more of a motivation to, to not prosecute. But the person, but people who are being cheated, the voters, could then bring a civil suit if Yes, that's, Ms. that's correct. Lawson's they could gather passed. together if they felt, you know, if they felt that uh, they had enough evidence to show where their vote may have been canceled in some way by an illegal vote or a vote that had been submitted as a collection of votes by either some candidate on the other side or by a group working for said candidate. I think that's important to be able to have that option. Yeah, I, th I think that the issue when it comes to finding all of the, uh, the election fraud, now, I was the author of the bill that Ms. Swanson is basically amending by adding a section. And one thing I found out is if, when it comes to the criminal authorities and the folks who have to investigate this and aren't really keen on getting into political stuff, you can't find what you don't look for. Exactly. I'll tell you, you come to my county, you'll find plenty of fraud if you're looking. Yeah, exactly. And Thank you, here, in, here in Travis County, I've, I've had problems here too, so I understand your point of view and, and thank you for the question. Mr. Chairman. Chair organized Representative Clardy. Senator Clardy. Thank you, Chairman Kane. Mr. Green, good to see you again this morning. Oh, thank you. Um, Y'all changed the date on me. Uh, we, we've done that. <laughs> I was ready to go for Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> well, happy Tuesday. May the 4th be with you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> on the... Um, you were waiting to say that, weren't you? <laughs> uh, so on, uh, I don't know how much time you've had to look at uh, Representative Lawson's uh, bill, um, but you had mentioned something in your kind of introductory comments that this is not for just one or two. This is for the 100 and 130. Yeah. Where you talk about conspiracy, you're talking a conspiracy here. If it's organized, you've, that means one or, more, one or more people get together and say, we're going to do this. And then it goes right out of the, the realm of, oh, I think I'll just vote a couple of times over here or I'll pick up a couple, two or three votes uh, from the nursing home. Right. But... Uh, I, so, I'm, I'm, I'm looking through the bill. I just don't see any sort of either limitation or uh, design for it to be for larger volumes of votes. It just it it, it just says it, down down in uh, section G, a person is liable under this section or other law for any amount of damages arising from organized election fraud. But, Activity uh, is jointly liable for any other defendant for the entire amount of damages arising from the activity. So it's like the, like the driver of the getaway car is also guilty of the bank robbery. Mm -hmm. But, it's, but my, my point is nowhere, it doesn't, you know, two or more gets you to a conspiracy. Two or more people, two or more accounts could, right. you could trigger the, the, the provisions of this. You know, it's not designed, it is, I think what you laid out or, or suggested was it's designed for, you know, multiple counts, large volumes of counts, and that's that's not a limiting factor in this bill as it's... As it's uh, Probably I, not. I mean, I just, I don't know if Texas law still reads the same way, but um, even conspiracy to commit a misdemeanor is, yeah. I still think is supposed to be a felony, isn't it? And I guess one of the concerns I have with this bill, when I get into it, 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 it says what is or what is not a defense. So let's say there's been an allegation made. And there are, there would be, if this were law, dual jurisdiction in a criminal and also in a civil court. And it appears, and I think it's common, that the criminal matters are prosecuted first, um, but it's not a defense. Uh, so let's, let's just say so you were accused of committing, uh, conspiring to commit voter fraud, mm -hmm. and you've had to endure the wrath of the state. The slings and arrows of outrageous versus, torment. Versus Mr. Green. And you have successfully defended your case, and you're not responsible. Uh, under this bill, that wouldn't, it reads as if that wouldn't even be able to be admitted in the civil case, and that it is not a defense to the action that you've been found uh, innocent in a court of law. Does that seem fair to you? No, not no, not at well, if all. If you've been found innocent by a jury of your peers in a criminal matter, I would think yeah. that would be relevant to a civil action, don't you? I would think so, yes. And, and then I likewise, think it, would preclude... it goes on and says another alleged participant in the organized election fraud activity has been acquitted. It's not a defense to say you're accusing me of acting with 
Representative Gonzalez and that we have conspired to commit a crime, but if she's found uh, innocent, again, in a court of law, tried by a jury of her peers, that that is not a, a defense to the conspiracy action, which would not make sense if the other, the other quote, co-conspirator in the civil matter has been found not guilty in a court of law. But you can't assert that as a defense. I'm just saying from a legal mm. perspective, you know, let, let, let's don't forget, when you talk about invoking the state of Texas versus, that is a very, very powerful and dangerous thing. Yeah. Uh, Been there. I won that case. Our, if we go back to our Constitution and look at many of the pro prohibitions and, and, and elements that are in the, the, the rights provided under the Bill of Rights, it is to protect individuals from uh, an onerous and oppressive uh, government. Absolutely. And, and the, the Fifth Amendment uh, and some of those protections we have, this really flies in the face of it. And you would mentioned something, Mr. Green, about the... the um, resources of the state, the courts are bur burdened. I'm going to shift that with you a little bit and see if you'd agree with this. If All we're right. looking at the resources of the Attorney General's office, which are somewhat limited, particularly for voter fraud, I think, I don't see Mr. White in here, but we only have, I think, four prosecutors in that group that he's the, the chief of and a handful of investigators. We would be dumping on top of them now not only the criminal prosecution, which I think should be paramount, um, but also potential civil actions. And there's only so much to go around, and I would be worried that we're diluting the, the criminal prosecutorial ability of the state of Texas through the Attorney General's office, whose job it is to represent the state of Texas, to pursue civil matters, which fundamentally is a matter of damages, which is a matter of money. That's what civil courts are for. These are money courts, not, not uh, to pr deprive you of liberty. Um, don't, wouldn't you be concerned that we might take away from the, the, uh, the, the stated purpose of the Attorney General's office to, to defend the state of Texas from voter fraud? I don't think that they would be, that people would be inclined to file suit in a case unless they had considerable evidence. And to, to address your thing about the Attorney General's office, it tends to work a little bit like an emergency response operations. They move people around within their department as is needed. So they may move some people from one criminal investigation area into elections at the time when it may be needed. So they float their personnel around. Right. So I've been told. So, um, and, then, and then finally, I say to a point that Mr. Schofield made, um, as far as is how this is is prosecuted, the state is being awarded the the civil penalties. So again, you've got uh, unlimited resources of the state pursuing money damages from an individual who's been accused of a of uh, activity, which, according to the bill, the person may have been already been found innocent of. Um, I would think better resources of the state would be to, if we're going to do this, to create a private cause of action because the, I think Mr. Veers... To pay the person who, said, who, Mr. Veers, who was hurt by... We've got 130 people, and it, it's uh, discriminatory to people of color whose votes are stolen. To me, that's the person who's been harmed, that they should have the private cause of action to pursue that. And then, then that change and say, look, this is my name. They voted my name. I took my... And I was, in fact, in those circumstances, I think we've heard testimony where those people showed up to vote and were told, you've already, They've already voted. <laughs> okay. That's real harm. If that yeah. happens to me, I want to be able to get to court. And, and you ought to be able to get somebody. money from the person who stole your money. I ought to be the one getting the money. <laughs> um, but and it's, the, the bill is silent. I know this is a, a, a first crack at it, but it, it doesn't speak to attorney's fees. I would think you could create private calls of action, provide for attorney's fees, but also I would think it, it should be work both ways that prevailing party wins because, you know, if you bring a suit against somebody, you ought to Loser pays. the game. If you're going after somebody for purposes of harassment or just vexatious litigation and you choose to, you know, I think I'll sue this person and shake them down for money, and you lose uh, because you didn't have a good claim, yeah, you should have then to. the person who you sued should be able to come back to you and recover that same money. Sure. So just some random thoughts of a lawyer <laughs> up too early in the morning. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, anybody else? Members, any other questions for this witness? None. Thank you. Thank you. The chair calls Dr. Laura Presley. Good morning, man. I've got you as Dr. Laura Presley here on behalf of True Texas Elections LLC, and you are for this bill. Is that correct? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Kane and members. And um, 
My problem with this bill is it doesn't go far enough. The, it is limited to Title I through seven chapters of the election code, and that goes back to the 276.012, Representative Schofield, that's your, your, um, your bill that got put into law. What's interesting is Title I through Seven really just deals with absentee voting. And absentee voting is 5 to 15 percent of the vote. What about the other 85 percent that's electronic voting? There are Title VIII statutes, uh, Chapter 122, 123, 125, 127, 128, and 129, all have to do with voting systems, electronic voting, computerized voting system, direct recording electronic voting machines, processing electronic voting results. 85% of the election results are there. I would like to see this expanded, Representative Slauson, to those statutes of uh, those chapters of Title VIII. Why focus just on 15% of the vote? We got to deal with the other 85%. I do agree with Representative Clardy with regarding to potentially pulling the AG out of this. They're already taxed enough. They can't even do their misdemeanor um, complaints. That I've, I've filed five complaints with various counties, Travis County, Dallas County, Bear County, that they can't even get to. The AG tells us, especially in Bear County, when they did the interviews of the witnesses in the cases that were submitted for criminal investigation, that the Bear County DA won't call them back because, as you said, Representative Schofield, that if the DA in the county, why buy the hand that feeds you? So my recommendations are to uh, go ahead and include Title VIII, which are the 85% of where people vote, and change this to be really civil actions where they the level of proof is different and um, candidates and voters especially with regard to measures when you've got a billion dollar bond and you do an election contest and the bar for an election contest to reverse an election is really high also so it would be good to have a civil remedy and i'm here for there are any questions thank you uh, members any questions hearing none thanks so much chair calls carol edwards Carol Edwards. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on, for, or against House Bill 3424? If not, the chair recognizes Representative Slauson to close on the bill. Thank you all very much. And Rep Representative Busey, I appreciate your comments this morning. I think that you and I definitely agree that the uh, entire democracy depends on the security of our elections. We may come at it from different directions and reach different conclusions, but on that we definitely agree. And Representative Clardy, I look so forward to talking to you later today, because if you are about deputizing an army of private attorney generals to enforce laws in this state, I have something else I'm gonna come visit with you about later today. But on that note, I appreciate the time of the committee this morning, and I would request a favorable vote out of committee, and I will close. Excellent, thank you. Members, any questions for the author? Surprising. The Surprising. chair recognizes well, Representative Clardy. To, to be clear, and Representative Slauson, thank you uh, for your comments, but I'm not for deputizing people <laughs> and bring it into the criminal side, uh, but, you know, it's hard for lawyers to make a living these days, so if you know, give them that opportunity to bundle cases and, and do this profitable, fair way, encourage uh, performance at the people to be right in their voting habits. Yes, Representative Schofield and I would agree with that comment, Representative Clardy. Um, thank you, ma'am. And members, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. There is no objection. The bill will be left pending. Is there objection? Jair here is none, and the bill is left pending. All right. At this time, the chair is going to pass the gavel to Representative Schofield to handle the next. Chair lays out House Bill 661 and also lays out the committee substitute. 
The chair recognizes Representative Beckley to explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to lay out HB 661 today. I do have a committee substitute, but there's no change in the language of the original bill. The only difference is the draft number at the bottom of the page. The purpose of this bill is to make it easier for eligible Texans to vote. The long established co countywide polling place program, also known as vote centers, allows constituents to vote anywhere within their counties rather than one assigned polling location, which is the standard system. To be a participant of the countywide polling place program, an application on behalf of the county must be submitted to the Secretary of State's office, which will then undergo a deliberation process before being accepted or rejected. Currently, only counties that use purely electronic election systems are permitted to apply for the countywide polling place program. This excludes most Texas counties from even applying for this program that would make voting substantially more accessible for our constituents. My county of Denton, is, De Denton County is one of these excluded from applying, among them Cherokee and Nacogdoches counties, which, Mary, which Mr. <laughs> Clarity represents as well, and 173 other counties. I got a good staff. Um, this is a major problem. In these counties, someone who takes time out of their busy day, waits in a long line, and finally checks in at the polls can be turned away for not being in their assigned location. This leaves many with no time to vote and little motivation. HB 661 simply allows any Texas county to apply to the countywide polling place program and removes the requirement that uses purely electronic systems to do so. The Secretary of State can then determine which counties to accept and which to deny participation based on the merits of their election systems and applications. With that, unless this, the committee has any questions, I reserve the right to close. Members, are there any questions for Representative Beckley? Hearing none, we will proceed to testimony as soon as I can make sure I have it up on my screen properly. Give us just a second and we will start calling you up. Here we are. Okay, Mr. Clint Bush. There you go. Mr. Bush, we have you registered as Clint Bush. Uh, testifying for Liberty County and yourself, and you are for the bill. Is all of that correct? That is correct, yes, sir. Please proceed. Members, good morning. My name is Clint Bush. I'm the elections administrator for Liberty County, and I am in favor of House Bill 661. I represent the County of Liberty and myself, as stated. Uh, Liberty County is a fast-growing rural county adjacent to Houston. I know that citizens in Liberty County and Nacogdoches County and many other rural counties overwhelmingly want a paper electronic hybrid. This bill adds to current law, allowing a paper electronic hybrid to be used in vote centers. Current law allows these machines to be used in Texas elections, just not vote centers because of outdated language in the law. More and more counties are moving to vote centers for convenience of the voter. This bill in no way lessens the security of each ballot. This in no way adds to the process of ballot by mail. This bill is a simple fix to current law that expands vote centers electronic systems in Texas with the paper trail. Thank you for your time and work and I urge your support. Members, any questions for the witness, Ms. Beckley? Yeah. Left my mic on the whole time. That's a good thing I didn't say anything. Um, so I just wanna clarify, so during early voting, we can, or is your county as well, can vote anywhere? Yes, except, yeah, and so it's just election day. It's so just this, election. We're making election day the same as early voting. Yes, ma'am, as I read the bill. Thank you. Any further questions for the witness? Thank you for your testimony. You. The chair calls Alan Vera. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the chair calls Dr. Laura Presley. All right, you are registered as Dr. Laura Presley representing True Texas Elections LLC and you are for the bill, is all that correct? I'd like to change it to on. I'd like to change it to on? Give yes, us a please. second here. Thank you. Very good, and please proceed. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to focus on a different section than what was 
has been really has discussed uh, previously. Section C, and I'm going to read it in the change. In conducting the program, the Secretary of State shall provide for an audit <coughs> of the voting system equipment before and after the election and during the election to the extent such an audit is practicable. I really like that, but I think it's confusing that it needs to be more detailed of what voting system equipment is. If you go to chapter 122, section point oh oh three, there's definitions of what voting system equipment is. Voting system equipment means any kind of mechanical, electrochemical, or electronic apparatus for use in a voting system. And then you go to definition of voting system means a method of casting and processing votes that is designed to function um, an electronic apparatus for casting and processing votes. The programs, operating manuals, tabulation cards, printouts, and software necessary. To my knowledge right now, the Secretary of State does not do an audit of software. They do not do an audit of the ballot marking device machines. They do not do an audit of the central accumulator. This, what you're putting in here, Representative Beckley, I really like. It expands it, but I think there needs to be a little more detail of what that audit looks like. I would love the Secretary of State to audit the software of the central accumulator, and there are ways to do that, but I don't think the Secretary of State has any software engineers to go audit it. I don't think they do. Um, they would have to hire people, which I would like them to do that. For example, the software, um, I don't know if you've heard the term hash code. It is an authorization code that the software is the actual software that was certified nationally. No one goes in and checks the software before and after the election to make sure the tabulation was done correctly to the software that was certified. There was an election contest in Dallas that it looks like the software that was loaded on the central accumulator was not the certified version. Election contest in 2019, May 19, election contest that I was an expert witness on. So I love this, but I think there needs to be some details that we need to go really do the audit of this equipment to make sure that it's what was certified and what's supposed to be there. Any questions? Members, anybody have a question for the witness? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. The chair calls Susan Carranza. Oh, there you are. I have you registered as uh, Susanna, I'm sorry. Susanna Coran, you've been testifying enough, I ought to have your name right by now. I figured. Uh, uh, you are, so you're Susanna Carranza, you are registering for yourself and you are for the bill, is that correct? Yes. Please proceed. Um, I would uh, like to thank you for proposing this bill. Uh, it's high time that voting, uh, countywide voting is available everywhere uh, because Sometimes people vote near where they live, sometimes people vote near the, where they work, or sometimes people only have the time to vote somewhere in between. And this absolutely allowed that. I applaud that. I think it's, we have the systems. It's time that there is no reason to be just in some places. Thank you so much, and I urge everybody to support this bill. Does anybody have a question for the witness? Thank you for your testimony. The chair calls Ed Johnson. Mr. Johnson, I see you registered as Ed Johnson, testifying for yourself and against the bill. Is all of that accurate? That is accurate. Please proceed. Okay, Ed Johnson here. Been a long time in elections in Harris County um, and actually kind of working on this statewide. Um, this bill will allow you to vote twice, basically is what, what's gonna happen here. Uh, the statistics that were laid out of all these counties that can't do countywide voting, but are doing early voting, 99% of them only have one early voting location in their county. These are the small counties. That's why they can early vote and you can go drive in to the wherever the 
off government election offices and vote in those counties. But these counties have multiple precincts. They probably have at least four because you have four county commissioners in every district. So on election day, you have four polling locations. This bill, if you don't have any real-time communication between all four locations, you are going to be able to go to all four locations and vote on election day. So it's, it's a very bad thing. The verifiable paper trail has already been ruled by the AG's office that it is an electronic voting device that could be used. This bill also, I believe, will allow you just to use paper ballots if you wanted that's to. That's not you, you have a minute and 57 seconds. I do, okay. Yeah, that's for the prior witness, sorry, we didn't turn okay. it off. Okay, so y yes, uh, it would also allow you not to use electronic machines and to just use paper ballots. Um, which you would run into a problem too on election day because you would have to have probably four precincts in a very small county and you would have to have multiple ballot styles at each precinct where you could possibly run out because everybody may want to go to one polling location. You cannot plan for election day. And again, that's not you. Okay, well, I think I'm through. Okay. Oh, perfect, perfect. We get two for the price of one, that's great. Does anybody have any questions for the witness? Thank you, Mr. Johnson, Thank for you. your testimony. The only other registered witness I have is the uh, Secretary of State, uh, designee Keith Ingram. Does anybody have questions for Mr. Ingram if he's here? I don't even see him. Oh, if he is back there, see, wearing these masks, I can't tell you anymore. If you hide that luxurious beard, how am I supposed to know you're here? <laughs> Does anybody want to hear from Mr. Ingram? Please keep your seat. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on, for, or against House Bill 661? If not, the chair recognizes Representative Beckley to close on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, I ask for your favorable consideration. I close. Oh, I'm sorry, we're, we were talking about what bill came next and I'm, we passed right over the bill that we have right now. I'm done. Very good. Okay. Thank you, Representative Beckley. If there is no objection, the committee substitute will be withdrawn and the bill will be left pending. Is there objection? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is withdrawn and the bill is left pending. The chair lays out House Bill 2993 and recognizes Representative Morales Shaw to explain the bill. Good morning, Chairman Schofield and Vice Chairwoman Gonzalez and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to bring before you HB 2993. This is a bill about taking advantage of a missed opportunity that's long been overlooked. And until this bill came before me, I really wasn't aware of it myself. But there's something called the Transportation Workers Identification Credentials and also known AKA as the TWIT card and it's something that was started to be issued after 9-11 for anyone who works at a critical infrastructure. So uh, being in Texas, we've got lots of those. We've got ports, we've got uh, chemical industry, we've got airports uh, and all of anything that contains a critical infrastructure. These are issued, they're even more stringent than a driver's license. They require more proof uh, and they're issued by the federal government. And this bill would amend the election code to add TWIT card as an acceptable form of ID for people to be able to vote. Uh, there are over 3 million cardholders uh, in the nation, but given that Texas is such a heavy, heavy industry state, we have a lot of those people here. Um, and I kind of wondered when I first saw this bill, like, well, why don't they just have a driver's license, right? But if we think about how these people go into critical infrastructures, sometimes they are in a jumpsuit and sometimes all they have is that card and they're transported into these, these critical infrastructure locations. So if it's voting and there's limited time, it's a way to just make it more possible for them to use that to ID themselves at a voting poll. So I, um, that's the essence of it. I can answer any questions. There may be a couple of witnesses here. Uh, and I'd like to request my right to close. Mm -hmm. Yes, Representative, you do have three witnesses. Well, you have reserved your right to close. Thank Does you. anybody have any questions for the author? Boy, we're being nice this morning. All right. In that case, we'll proceed to testimony. Uh, the chair calls Joanne Richards. Is Joanne Richards here? 
Oh. While you're making your way up here, I see that you have registered as Joanne Richards, uh, rep, uh, testifying on behalf of Common Ground for Texans and yourself, and that you are for the bill. Is all of that accurate? That's correct. Please proceed. Those of us with hip replacements recently take a little while to get up. <laughs> well, I hope you're doing better. I am indeed, thank you very much. Um, we are in support of this bill. Um, we are in support of any bill that increases the uh, eligible um, documentation that one needs to, to go vote. We only wish that other forms of state and federal issued photo IDs were included in this bill. Um, this is the first step in what we hope are many steps toward allowing eligible voters to vote with government issued photo IDs. Thank you very much. Members, are there any questions for the witness? Thank you for your testimony. The chair calls up Renee Lara. Ah, oh, there you are. You have uh, registered as Renee Lara, uh, on testifying on behalf of the Texas AFL-CIO, and you are for the bill. Is all that correct? Yes, sir. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Renee Lara, Legislative Director, Texas AFL-CIO, and I'm here uh, speaking in support of House Bill 2993 by Representative Penny Morales Shaw. Um, I am uh, here representing more than 240,000 union members in the private and public sector across the state. Um, many of them happen to work around the ship channel uh, and they use Twit cards. Um, I'm talking about uh, United Steelworkers, uh, longshoremen, seafarers, uh, building trades, and other workers who work in docks and ports. Um, here in Texas, and they use um, these TWIC cards issued by the Transportation Security Administration uh, for security purposes. And the card, um, as has been stated already, verifies a person's identity through the use of biometrics, embedded chip technology, um, and if it's uh, good enough to secure our ports and docks uh, critical infrastructure facilities, it ought to be good enough to use uh, for voting purposes. I have a quick question. Do you, are you, and you may not know the answer, but so, so this agency, is this under the Department of Transportation? Is it a separate sort of independent agency? Do we know what, where they reside? Uh, the Transportation Security Administration? Yes. Um, I believe they're under H. Homeland Security. Well, you know what? I'm not going to. I do not. That, not not putting you to the question. test. Just, just a question. Um, I'll ask the author if she knows. But yeah, it, absolutely. Either way. Thank you. Does anybody else have questions for the witness? Yes, Ms. Beckley. Thank you for coming today. So um, I'm listening. So this has biosecurity. So this this form of ID is actually a lot harder to get than a driver's license. Um. It, they do have a background check. Yes. Yeah, so and I, I talked to one of our leaders, uh, United Steelworkers uh, leaders, and uh, it ha we do know that it has been used for many years now, and it is used f to secure these facilities. Um, my understanding is that the background check exists. Um, it's probably longer and more thorough than the background check for a uh, driver's license. Thank you. And, uh, and we do represent uh, TSA. <laughs> um, Workers, so I, I will find out the name of that agency, Mr. Chairman. It's not on you. I just I you can. happen to be the witness in front of me. It's not on you. Does anybody else have any questions for the witness? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Ed Johnson. Chair calls Ed Johnson. Mr. Johnson, you have uh, registered as Ed Johnson, testifying for yourself against the bill. Is all of that accurate? That is accurate. Please proceed. Okay. Um, I think that uh, my experience in running elections in Harris County, that the six forms of ID, basically photo IDs that you have now, are more than adequate. Um, have found very, very few people that don't have one of those forms of six ID, you know, those IDs. Um, these people working here, I've never heard anything that they don't have one of these other IDs that they could present at a polling location. If we open this up to every photo ID out there, every work photo ID available, that list and, and the, the burden put on the election judge running the election would be huge. I mean, you know, they would have to have memorized different ideas that are acceptable or not. I think for the election judge's sakes, 
it's best to keep it to a list of IDs that you have, you know that, that everybody has, and, and keep the list fairly narrow so that you don't have to go through all this research to figure out if this is an acceptable form of ID or not. Um, I, I believe that it does it. And, and Texas has expanded. You know, it used to be you only had one form of ID that you showed up with. You had to show up with your voter registration card. You can go vote before photo ID unless you had your voter registration card. Texas has expanded it to six different forms of ID now that you can show. Um, but we can go way over the other end and, and have just way too many to where it makes it really hard on the election clerks to do this. Does anybody have questions for the witness? Thank you, sir, for your testimony. The only witness we have remaining is the resource witness from the Secretary of State's office. Does anybody need to hear from the Secretary of State on this? All right, is there anyone else who wishes to testify on, for, or against House Bill 2993? I, I didn't register to testify, but I registered uh, on the bill. Do you want to testify or do you just want to register it on the bill? I Let me find out. <laughs> you're on. You're on the list. We can change you to testifying. So come on up. But give me a second for your name. Let I me mean, come on up. But before you start talking, give, oh, your name's popped up already. It was literally a second. Uh, you are still Susanna Carranza. You are uh, registered for yourself, and you're for the bill. Is all that correct? Yes, it's correct. Please proceed. Thank you. And the reason I decided to testify right now is because I was a poll worker on Saturday on this election. And I can tell for sure that some people have like a really uh, important, uh, very vetted worker ID, but have not had a chance to get a driver's license and never had a passport for different reasons. And because of that, it makes life a lot di more difficult to, to vote. It's actually, if there was a, if that ID was allowed, it would be easier than having to sign a, a reasonable impediment. So as a poll worker, it's my duty to just learn everything that's required. It doesn't matter that I have to learn a little bit more. Same thing for the judge. So I support this bill because it expands to use um, a document that is truly vetted. And I know it's done by the TSA because it just so happened when I got my TSA check uh, that was in the same office that does the same uh, approvals for uh, this component. And you have to do all sorts of biometrics and photograph and interview and it takes a long time. So I support this bill and I urge you all to uh, vote for it. Does anybody have any questions for the witness? Mr. Clardy? I would like resource witness. Very good. Anybody, would anybody have a question for this witness before we do that? Ms. Carranza, thank you very much for your testimony. And I will, uh, the chair will call up Christina Adkins from the Secretary of State's office. And you know the drill. Your name is Christina Adkins. You are here on behalf of the Texas Secretary of State, uh, and you are on the bill. That's correct. Mr. Clardy. Thank you, Mr. Schofield. Uh, Ms. Adkins, good to see you this morning. morning. Uh, some of the testimony from the previous witnesses got me to thinking that there has been this expansion over time in Texas of a permissible or allowable uh, photo ID. Uh, it, do you know kind of how long that's been going on? When I guess we did, had the first photo ID, is that 2011? 13, 11, maybe? Yeah. 11, Correct. 13? Uh, the, for our recent, what we have right now with respect to current ID, there was a law passed in 2011. Um, there was litigation regarding that, that piece of legislation. It was Senate Bill 14. Um, in 2013, uh, the law changed because of a Supreme Court case dealing with um, the Voting Rights Act and preclearance. And so the voter ID bill went into effect in, around 2013, okay. summer of 2013. And has the list ex been expanded incrementally over time? It, it has in that there was some additional litigation um, after implementation of the, of the law in 2013. Um, that litigation resulted in an expanded list, what we call our list B ID. So there's now additional documentation that a voter can provide um, as long as they complete what's also called the reasonable impediment declaration. It's a form they fill out in the polling place indicating their reason for not being able to obtain uh, one of the seven acceptable IDs. And that is what our law is now. What has been the role of the Secretary of State's office to, does the Secretary of State's uh, office have a, a, a 
duty or has it exercised some sort of discretion over what is and what is not an allowable ID? We don't have discretion in that we don't, we cannot expand the list that's provided because that's provided by statute, but we do provide some training on what the acceptable IDs are and what um, the list B, we call them IDs are. And so we do have examples on our website where we show people, you know, examples of types of records or documents that can be used. Has the Secretary of State's office ever been asked to do the vetting of or the research into the validity or the accuracy, the trustworthiness of uh, different IDs? No, sir. Okay, yeah. so that's been done exclusively by the legislature, committees like this, right. who say well, we want to add these. All right, so let me ask a different question. Uh, if, if we make that decision and then you do the training on these IDs, um, what recommendations or things would you think the Secretary of State would want to see before you're asked to train people how to use it? It would seem that you would want to make sure that they are good, valid, reliable IDs in the first place. Are there criteria or are there things that you'd say, any ID that the, the legislature approves ought to at least have X, Y, and Z as kind of components of their process? We heard a testimony a while ago, I think from Mr. Lara, uh, of the, the biometric search, of the background searches, of the, the chip embedded. You know, what, what things would you be looking for that would make the Secretary of State's office comfortable that we have valid ID that's properly vetted and is reliable for election purposes? Well, the, the role of the ID in the election process is to validate a person's identity. Um, it's so, so that there's a name on there, so that there's, you know, uh, a photograph in this situation, what we're talking about for the seven acceptable IDs that we have now, so that the poll worker can use that to validate that the person is who they say they they are. Um, it, it doesn't really do much beyond that as far as, you know, residency is not established with the ID process. It, it's just purely for identity purposes. So I think whatever the legislature deems, you know, acceptable for establishing identity, we're going to train on and we're going to provide examples of what those IDs look like. Because that's the most important thing is that the polling place worker knows what they're looking at and they know what to look for when somebody presents an ID. They know visually what, what an acceptable ID is. And, and to the point that's troublesome or, or hard on a poll watcher or a, a, a poll worker, I'm sorry, um, to keep up with an expanding list of IDs. You know, I think that those are, that list is probably available at the polling locations or that the election Absolutely. judge would have that list. Absolutely. And, you know, I, and nobody, I think, is wanting to suggest that we ought to use a Costco card or a, you know, <clears throat> here's my in a car, gold member card, or whatever that happens to be. Um, but, uh, you know, as long as it's, it, it seems to me that if we, the whole purpose of the voter, uh, the photo ID was to be able to say, this is that person, uh, and then tie that down and have that documented for purposes of verifying the vote. So as long as we have a reliable ID, whether it be a student ID from a proper institution or whether it be a a uh, car that's been vetted by Homeland Security or TSA or whatever it happens to be, um, that would sat as, it would seem to me to be able to tie it to the person's registration, the, 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 the sticking point, the part that, that's really relevant for purposes of the, everything from how we validly vote, but also to prosecution for uh, misappropriating identification is tied to the registration and then exercising that registered uh, vote, not the form of the ID. That, yeah. Well, and I just, just to add beyond that, um, you know, the, the original voter ID law had a provisional process. <clears throat> if a person didn't have one of those IDs, they could vote provisionally and then cure that lack of ID. When the law was expanded because the litigation happened to expand our list and then the legislature codified um, many parts of that um, expanded list process, um, our, our number of voters that have had to use that provisional process has dropped pretty significantly. Once those additional IDs were added and the reasonable impediment declaration process came into being, um, we have not had very many people use the provisional process. And, and I think that is, is one of the goals, I think, of all members of this committee, that everyone who's eligible to vote and exercise that right, their vote should be counted. Uh, and so by reducing the number of provisional ballots, that's we've affected that, that goal. Is that correct? Um, yes, sir. I mean, that, that number's gone down significantly. Even the number of people that have been using the reasonable impediment declaration process, I mean, I think it, I mean, it's less than 1% of voters. All right. Thank you. 
Let me ask you a quick question. Uh, are you, first of all, are you familiar with this form of identification? Um, so I looked it up when I, when I saw that the bill was filed. Um, so I, I don't have a huge broad swath of knowledge on it. I'm just aware of what it is. And, and I'm not either, but I would, I'm, I'm cognizant of what Mr. Johnson said about, you know, I know we have limited training for our poll workers and if we end up with 27 or 28 different forms of ID as we add them over time, you're gonna get to the point where they don't know what they're looking at. So my, I think my first thought would be, is a form of ID that we're looking to add something that somebody who doesn't have one of the five already in law is likely to have. So in other words, if you've got a driver's license in your wallet, just use that, why pull out another card? But if you're, if you're a type of person that isn't going to have one of these five, would this new one be something you're likely to have and is also something that shows us that it is what it is. Do you know enough about this to know if someone who has a transportation work or identification credential is likely to not have a driver's license or a military ID or, or a passport or any of that stuff? So when I did look up the this particular type of ID card, it does seem like, I, I agree with the testimony that we've heard so far, that it does seem like it's a an ID that's heavily vetted and that you do have to provide multiple levels of, of right. identity, validation of your identity and documentation. Um, in order to even obtain one of these cards. Well, I get that. I'm just mm -hmm. saying, is it something that would that would allow a voter who's gonna look in their wallet or purse and go, oh heck, I don't have the appropriate ID to vote. Is that person likely to have this? And I would think, I could be wrong, but I would think they probably drive to work and have a driver's license. But I, again, I could be wrong about that. We don't have a whole lot of mass transit in this state. Um, um, I, I can tell you that anecdotally, the driver's license is the most commonly used form of identification in the polling place. I wonder if, I don't want to make that Secretary of State do any more work than possible, but I wonder if anybody has any any way to get numbers on what percentage of people show what. You know, that's typically not tracked. Um, we, and I don't want to make yeah, we, more work. We, we <laughs> appreciate that. Um, but we generally um, advise our counties not to track any additional information than what the law would otherwise authorize them to collect. Um, just that may not be appropriate. And so um, I don't believe that the great majority of our counties have, have data like that at, available to them. Very good. Are there any other questions, qu questions for the witness? Real quick. Oh, Mr. Busey. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Ms. Atkins, there's been some talk about concern about having to memorize all these IDs, mm -hmm. but my experience is there's usually a printout for the people right there, and it usually has a photo of the ID, right? And so if you're checking, you've got a cheat sheet kind of, is that part of the training process? Um, that's correct. I mean, we have an ID, a presentation that we've provided that gives examples of all the different types of IDs. And then my understanding is that a lot of our counties and a lot of our local entities will also either take that presentation and, and provide it as a handout or create their own handout with, with examples. Now, to help with that burden, voting is a right. Wouldn't it be easier to just get rid of all IDs? and go back to the right the voting is, and then you don't have to train that at all. Well, I think that is a policy decision <laughs> for you all to make. I appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, I'd be a little more comfortable knowing the person is who they say they are when I go to vote, and I'm willing to show everybody I'm who I say I am. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Sure. Uh, now, I guess we're back to where we started, which is, is there anyone else who wishes to testify on, for, or against House Bill 2993? If not, and hopefully not, the chair recognizes Representative Morales Shaw to close on the bill. Thank you, Chairman and members. Um, again, these are workers from airports, ports, longshoremen, uh, chemical plants, and other critical infrastructures. Um, these are, this. I would say this is not opening the floodgates. This is a federal specialized issued ID. Um, and just, I think a lot of your questions, uh, Rep Clardy and Rep Beckley were answered. Uh, but just to elaborate a little bit, uh, who can, uh, what do you need to get to be able to apply, you have to provide your name, address, phone number, social security number, date of birth, place of birth, employer and sponsoring organization, biometric samples, either fingerprint or iris scan, uh, signature and photographs. So it is a more stringent process. Um, and as we heard from one of the witnesses, there are hundreds and thousands of these people who carry this kind of ID in each of our districts. I mean, we all have these kind of critical infrastructures in our districts. Um, I would say that if somebody comes, uh, if you, come to the poll, most likely you do have your driver's license because you usually have what you know you're gonna vote for. Um, but if you don't have that with you, that may prevent you from going to the poll. If you have a very small window of, of time, as we know that a lot of employees do, if they've had a long shift and uh, if you have any critical infrastructure workers in your families, uh, you might know that they have very unusual hours. 
and sometimes they're very lengthy, sometimes they're overnight. Uh, so it's a, it's a specialized group a lot of times. Uh, I want to share with you uh, also uh, to be eligible, you have to be a U.S. citizen um, or uh, have lawful status in the United States. And if I can, Chairman, if you'll indulge me, I want to show you the TWIC card is very distinguishable. It looks a lot like our state card, very easy to identify, has a chip in it. And this bill also doesn't have any significant fiscal note. I'll repeat that. Just to be okay, you want to talk into the mic on that? Yes. yes. I don't have a screen, but it's- You may want to repeat what you told yes. us while you were up here. Yeah, there is no uh, fiscal impact on this bill. And I just wanted to share that the TWIC card is very distinguishable. It looks a lot like our state IDs and it has a chip um, that's visible right on the front of the card. So I can answer any other questions possibly. Members, are there any questions for the author? There is, the uh, chair recognizes Representative Beckley. So, um, my districts um, in North Texas, for y'all that don't know, and we actually do have pretty good trains and public transportation, and our cities are building apartments specifically by these public transportation areas. So there are a lot of people that live in these areas. And um, when I was doing research on the, um, just why I, on the, North Texas does have a pretty good infrastructure compared to other cities in Texas as far as public transportation. Mm -hmm. and. And, and just south of my district, it, they're going to be putting, which I mean, it's very, I have a very small geographic district. They're going to be putting in a train that's gonna go east-west to the DFW airport. So considerably, you could have people all along that line that only have that ID mm. because they're going to work and not have a driver's license because people are, mm -hmm. tra people in my area are going to that. So them being able to hop off the train, go vote would be something much easier for them to do if they've already got the. I agree, and I think with uh, all of the urbanization and expansion of population in Texas that w we may see, and there's a big push for more mass transit as well, and you just reminded me, Representative Beckley, that this includes railroad workers as well, and so probably the people building those uh, in the transportation industry may also be TWIC card holders. Does anybody else have any questions for the author of the bill? In that case, I presume you close? Yes, thank you, and I ask for your favorable consideration. I know we have a little time left, but squeeze it in. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Representative yeah. Morales Shaw. If Valuing there... all these workers, really it is. Thank you. If there is no objection, the bill will be left pending. Is there objection? The chair hears none. The bill is left pending. Who are we going to next? Okay, apparently, have you all been informed that the chair would like to vote on a bill? Okay. Oh, is it mine? <laughs> we're fast, but we're not that fast. Uh, the chair lays out his pending business, House Bill 160. Members, this is the bill we heard previously relating to acceptable forms of identification for voting. Let me make sure that, oh, this is the college ID, okay. Uh, Vice Chair Gonzalez offers up a committee substitute. Is there objection to the op adoption of the committee substitute? The chair hears none and the substitute is adopted. Representative Fierro moves that House Bill 160 as substituted be reported favorably to the full House with the recommendation that it do pass and be printed. The clerk will call the roll. Chair Kane. Vice Chair Gonzalez. Aye. Beckley. Aye. Busey. Aye. Clardy. Aye. Fierro. Aye. Chaton. Aye. Schofield. No. One. There being six ayes, one nay, uh, the motion prevails. The chair lays out House Bill 46 and also lays out the committee substitute. The chair recognizes Representative Fierro to explain the bill. Thank you, Rep um, Chairman uh, Schofield. Mr. Fierro, before you get started too much, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say this, but uh, the, the uh, Representative Swanson is present. She already, was she already present? Okay. Sorry about that, Mr. Fierro. Oh, no, Please no. proceed. Thank you, Chairman Schofield, Vice Chair Gonzalez. Um, members, House Bill 46 simply amends the election code uh, that early voting clerks may be able to correct clerical errors in a vote by mail application by reaching out to the applicant through email. Under current law, there is no space provided in a vote-by-mail application uh, for a voter to enter their email address. 
Currently, whenever there is a clerical error in an application, an early voting clerk must mail a new application with a written notice given a uh, reason for rejection, and the applicant must return the correct application by mail or in person. HB 46 would create another option for early voting clerks to provide notice um, to the applicant of a rejection. And we have a committee sub that's being passed out. And the committee sub would adjust the language so that HB 46 would not allow an applicant to make changes or corrections to their application information by email, simply be notified. With that, uh, Chairman, I, um, I reserve my right to close. Does anybody have questions for the author? Hearing none, we will proceed to testimony. The chair calls Valerie DeBille. Valerie DeBille? All right. Trying to go for somebody we hadn't heard from yet this morning, but I guess I know, now know why. The chair calls Susanna Carranza. All right, you have registered as Susanna Carranza. You are testifying for yourself and you are for the bill. Is that all accurate? Yes, that's accurate. Please proceed. Um, thank you again for the bill. Uh, I think every effort to make easier, to notify, to allow corrections, to modernize our system so we can rely more on electronic systems that are that everybody's more used to use now and are more timely than having to have like mail notifications. Any effort to offer more options for the voter to correct any issues and have access to vote by mail, um, I'm for that. So thank you. Even a little thing makes a huge difference. Uh, Does anybody, oh, I'm sorry. I urge, you, I urge you to support this bill. Very good. Thank Does you. anybody have questions for the witness? Thank you for your testimony. The chair calls Glenn Maxey. Glenn Maxey, Texas Democratic Party, in support of the bill. Um, is that a surprise? <laughs> um, as we do more and more about being able to cure ballots, um, we need the ability to, of voters to give their email address, and so this is a great step in that direction. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for the witness? Thank you, Mr. Maxey. The chair calls up Ed Johnson. You have registered as Ed Johnson. You are testifying for yourself and you are against the bill. Is all of that accurate? Uh, that is accurate. Okay. Um, Please proceed. <coughs> yes. Uh, well, I, I didn't have, see the committee sub, but this bill would have made it to where you could submit our correct information on an application electronically, which a couple of sessions ago we took out because it was being abused by uh, vote harvesters. Uh, they were sending in electronic applications uh, and it, you know they were fraudulent. So I could see that this bill, I haven't seen the sub, if that fixes it or not, but the, the, the Bill spill would put it back in. Another one I would like to see added to this bill, I, I am for communicating to the voter if they have a problem with their application. Um, we should also include if they have provided this information, a phone number or an email on their voter registration card to contact just in case it is a vote harvester that did the application and got the information wrong. You could also email the email address on the voter registration card and send it. Um, it is, there's not a space on the card right now, but every time you do an online reg voter registration, it's captured. They, they have your email address. It comes from the DPS to the Secretary of State to the county. So actually- Assuming you email from your own computer. That's correct. And you know, if you're at home and you update your voter registration, update your driver's license, that email address is captured and actually is in the voter registration records. It's never been used. Um, I think this would be an excellent time to use it if you know you have um, something wrong with your voter registration application, email both addresses. I mean, if they're two different addresses or if you have an email address on the voter registration card, send them. But I would not make it to where they can send back changes. Uh, those need to be in. You'll be happy to know writing. that the committee sub takes that out. 
Okay, great. So that's that seems to be the major, and Mr. Fierro can tell us on closing, but that seems to be the major change between the filed version and the committee sub. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, uh, does anybody have any questions for the witness? Thank you very much for your Thank testimony. You. The chair calls Alan Vera. Mr. Vera, you are shown as uh, registering as Alan Vera, representing the Harris County Republican Party Ballot Security Committee, and you are on the bill. Is all of that accurate? Oh, that's correct. Please proceed. Uh, we are totally fine with the voters being notified by email of the need to correct a ballot. We stumbled over the language that said the voter could correct the and cure the defect electronically or through email. Obviously, only the voter can make changes to the uh, to the documents, the official election documents, especially the carrier envelope, which is where most of the problems are. If the committee substitute is as said and removes that stipulation that the voter can correct electronically, then we would be in support of the bill. Okay, but we're going to leave you as on for the record. That's correct. Okay. I, I haven't seen the committee substitute. I just don't want to put any points of order on the bill. <laughs> Yeah, so I thank you. Very good. And um, oh, we have a new addition here. Uh, Renee Perez. Mr. Perez, you are shown as registering as Renee Perez, uh, representing the Libertarian Party of Texas and yourself, and you are for the bill. Is all of that accurate? Yes, that is accurate. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, members of the committee. I uh, just wanted to uh, give testimony that as a member of the Tarrant County Ballot Board the past three elections that I have seen this curing process work successfully. In addition, the county elections judge had uh, was personally involved in all the steps of the process. In fact, I, I remember we, he set aside a bin of these ones that we were had a question on labeled, set aside, and waited until the communication was complete to the satisfaction of everyone else, not just him. <laughs> uh, the other the other party liaisons took uh, part and parcel to make sure there was no concern, question of uh, the validity of, of what just occurred. So, and that's what I wanted to testify to because I hadn't heard that said by anyone else. Well, thank you. Does anybody have questions for the witness? I think that was quite illuminating. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, all we have left is the. Uh, oh, thank you. All we have left is the Secretary of State's office. Does anybody wish to call up the uh, Secretary? Apparently not. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on, for, or against House Bill 46? If not, the Chair recognizes Representative Fierro to close on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, um, with that, I close. Thank you. Oh. The chair recognizes Representative Clardy, though I'm sure he'll wish he hadn't. Not so fast, Mr. Fierro. Oh, thank you. No, I just want to be clear. I, I shared the reservations made the witnesses stated to the, the original file bill, mm -hmm. but the committee substitute, uh, just to be clear, it, it, it says that the email can be used or telephone. It's optional. Uh, it can be used to notify uh, the person of an error or problem with the application. Um, and then once they're notified, uh, it provides that they have, uh, looks like four days after they're notified to, to either submit a new application or to come in and fix it in person. Be delivered in person. Okay, so it's consistent with existing law as far as how we do registration. So the, the committee sub really does, to my mind, resolve the, the concerns, the grave concerns I have about both you and your legislation. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I can now reluctantly uh, support it, I believe. Thank you, Thank you. Representative. Representative Fiero, one question does come to mind. Uh, with the provision in the bill that allows the voter to submit a new application, what becomes of the old one? When we receive a new one, are we allowed to tear this one up, or what happens to the old one? Um, I suggest we ask the Secretary of State that question. I'll ask that offline. Thank very good. <laughs> Do you wish to close? Oh, very much so. <laughs> I thought you might. Uh, very good. Thank you, Representative Fierro. If there is no objection, the committee substitute will be withdrawn and the bill will be left pending. Is there objection? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is withdrawn and the bill is left pending. Don't go anywhere, Mr. Fierro. The chair lays out House Bill 696 and recognizes Representative Fierro to explain the bill. 
Thank you, Chairman. Uh, members, uh, 696 amends the election code so that voter registrars may notify voters re uh, registra uh, registration applicants of an application rejection by phone and or email. In Texas, the deadline for voters to submit a complete voter registration application, which must be postmarked at least 30 days before the election in which the applicant intends to vote for. Currently, whenever an applicant turns in a faulty application, the registrar must notify the applicant by mail, election code section 13.073, HB 696, uh, would allow registrar to use a phone or email to provide a quicker notice of a faulty application. Um, as you can see, registrars can very much uh, become a, a timely sensitive uh, issue for some applicants, and this is just modernizing the system. With that, Mr. Chair, I, um, I uh, reserve my right to close and I'll take any questions. I just have one question for you on the, uh, on the way it's, uh, this is done. At the beginning, we say the registrar may, no and this can also be a question for the witnesses, that's why I'm laying it out ahead of time. The, the registrar may notify the applicant by phone or email, but then later we, uh, we say the registrar shall make a reasonable effort to contact the applicant by phone or email. I, I think those two may be in conflict unless they have worked different sections somehow. And then uh, I just would offer my concern that I would prefer we have one rule for everybody, not sort of, I, I may, so I'm gonna call all the people I think are gonna vote for Jones and not so much the ones I think will vote for Smith. No, and, and uh, Mr. Chair, my intention was may. So, that, that just for the record. So I, I, I do get a little concerned by that because like I said, I don't, yeah. While I believe in discretion on, on technical matters, if we get to the point where these ones from this side of town are likely to vote for the bond, I think I'll call them. These ones may not vote for the bond. Eh, not I, so I, much interested in calling them. Your concern, I also didn't want to put the time restraint on this. <clears throat> and that was the reason, but, but um, it was something we can consider, please. Does anybody have any questions mm. for the author, Matt, Ms. Swanson? I had the same exact uh, concerns that you had, Representative Schofield, um, and I guess I could only support it or even consider it if it is a must. Like, Shall. we either do it in every county, every part of town, to every voter, or we don't do it. Because not only could they split by whatever, side of town or something, but it, it's not fair if in one county a lot fewer people get rejected because they are taking advantage of the May and another county is not. I, I think it's very important that everything be the same around the state so that everybody is treated equally. Absolutely, Representative. I, and I think that, um, again, my concern was a, from a time perspective on the, the staff, um, and that was the only reason. I, I would prefer that everyone shall be uh, reach, at least an attempt be made to reach out to them. So I don't, I'm not sure how we can fix that. Maybe we, we witnesses are, can talk about it, but. Many sub on that. Uh, right, I just want everybody to get, every voter to be treated the same across the state. And I, I agree with you, Representative. Okay, thanks. For the first time. Uh, uh, what? This morning. First time I support it. <laughs> Does anybody else on the panel have questions for the author? Uh, without that, we will proceed to testimony. The chair calls up, uh, Again, we've tried Valerie DeBille. Oh, here you are. And while you're making your way up, you have registered as Valerie DeBille, testifying on behalf of yourself, and you are for the bill. Is all that correct? That is correct. Please proceed. Um, to address your question about the may versus the shall, um, currently on the Texas, oh, I'm sorry, my name's Valerie DeBille. Um, no, we, we covered that. We're, <laughs> we're already good. covered that. All okay. right. Um, the Texas voter, reg voter registration application currently has the phone number as optional. It is not a mandatory part of the application. And the suggestion I believe in the bill is that email also be added as an optional thing. So you couldn't say shall be simply because not everybody's gonna be required to give that and not everyone will volunteer it. Um, for a little bit of background, um, I have registered a ton of people in Central Texas, almost a thousand in the last cycle. Um, I also have worked on the voter protection hotline, so we get a lot of calls from people who are confused as to why they their registration didn't go through. Um, and one of the biggest issues right now is that the Texas voter registration application does not have a space for an apartment number, and so people just forget it. 
And the problem with that is that the only current mechanism for validating a voter registration is to mail somebody their voter registration card and see if it gets set back. So if it doesn't get, so if it gets returned to the county offices, they don't have any, any idea if they don't have a phone number or an email address, how to get a hold of those people. So it just, they're just not registered because they forgot to put their email, their apartment number. So if one of those two pieces of information is available and as uh, Representative Hero's bill says, they should make their best effort to get a hold of people in that way, then that makes the registration application much more effective and eliminates that particular very specific problem that happens quite a lot. Yeah, I think, I think Mr. Fierro is on to something here in between this and other bills that we yeah. may have heard that we're not allowed to refer to. I think that <laughs> we're, we're, we're working towards a solution to make sure that voters who uh, whose applications or whose mail ballot applications are incorrect get, get corrected and hopefully we'll figure out the way to do that. Does anybody here have questions for the witness? Well, thank you very much for your testimony. It was good to hear from you. The chair calls Glenn Maxey. Glenn Maxey, Texas Democratic Party in support of the bill. Uh, the Election and, uh, Assistance Commission takes data uh, from our counties and of the counties in Texas that actually report it because a significant number of them didn't. But in 2020, 68, over 68,000 people had their voter registration rejected um, for an error. Uh, the only way those people got noticed, as was stated, is by a letter. They almost, I would assume that almost all of those people got that letter after the deadline for voter registration had passed. And as the previous witness said, um, things like not having apartment number means they never got the letter at all. So having an email uh, and having it to be shell, I don't think this is gonna be a big burden because I'm sure that what counties are gonna do is just set up their system so that they're batching these emails throughout the day and at the end of the day, they send one mass email to everybody saying, your application has an error, please give us a call or resubmit. It's gonna be a very simple thing for counties to do. And the portion of the bill that says they shall says make a reasonable effort. So it doesn't, you know, if, if there isn't an email address, the county's not in trouble. Correct. Does anybody have a question for the witness? Thank you, Mr. Maxey. Thank you. The chair calls Susanna Carranza. I, I passed the floor. Thank you. It's nice. We have to get to the floor in 15 minutes. The chair calls Ed Johnson. You have registered as Ed Johnson, uh, representing yourself, and you are against the bill. Is all that accurate? Uh, that is accurate. Please proceed. <laughs> yes, um, so we just heard in testimony that there were 68,000. Uh, in 2008, in Harris County, there were actually, uh, I was director of voter registration, 80,000 rejections that year. Uh, ACORN was working really hard and was submitting a ton of false applications. This voter registration application is not a very complicated document. It's your name and your address and your birth date. It's, you know, very simple information. And I have a hard time when people can't get their name, address, and birth date correct if it's actually them submitting it. So by doing all this and contacting, maybe emailing or phoning somebody that's a you know, trying to fraudulently register somebody, I don't think helps. Um, the other one I would look at, it says in the bill that you can email a voter registration application. Um, voter registration application sent by a county office, uh, according to the National Voter Registration Act, are supposed to be postage paid. So when being emailed would not meet the qualifications for being postage paid. Ah, so it wouldn't fit the NVRA. Yes. Well, that could be a little, little tweak. Yes, so so there there's there's another another little hiccup in it, but uh, yeah, I would I would look at uh, you know, it's not a complicated document, and I, I, you see a lot of fraudulent activity of people trying to register other people. Okay, so when I think this would help that. Does anybody have any questions for the witness? Recognize that we're going to be on the floor in 15 minutes. Yeah. Chair calls on Mr. Clardy. Thank you, Mr. Schofield. <clears throat> Mr. Johnson, you heard the previous the testimony of the previous witness about the. There's not a place on the voter registration 
uh, application to put insert an apartment number. And does that cause you any concern? That would that that seems pretty reasonable to me that it doesn't. Well, so in, in, in the state in the apartment. state code in the state code, it just says you, the application has to have a, a line for your address, right. and your apartment number is part of your address. So you know, I would think the voters should fill in their residence address. So do you think that making a change, that having worked election, uh, having worked voter registration in Harris County, do you think that what you're seeing where it says you, the address would allow without a change in legislation, the authorities to put in an apartment number as part of the address or space for one? Sure, you can, I mean, that, that, I, there's nothing wrong with adding a space for the apartment number, but I will tell you what we found is a lot of the times when the apartment number was left blank, these were apartment units that a vote harvester was working in the front office and they were collecting these voter registration certificates as they've tried to come back and, and harvesting ballot by mail. So they were not going to a particular apartment unit. Which, which uh, Mr. Johnson, is kind of my point. It, 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 this, I think it would help in both ways. I can't think of a form I don't see where I've had to put an address and it prompts in the form, either electronically or a, a, a hard copy, to what's the apartment number or unit number. Uh, but just for that purpose, it would, it would uh, I think, discourage and make it harder for vote harvesters to fraudulently use somebody else's idea. True, very true. All right, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for the witness? Thank you, Mr. Johnson. You. We have, the, uh, we have the, the Secretary of State, if anybody needs a resource witness. Seeing none, does anyone else wish to testify on, for, or against House Bill 696? Yes, I can change my mind and testify again. <laughs> Is that possible? We just shot her through the system? Let me make sure we can still pull you up. Don't want to put any points of order on the bill by doing it wrong. You can? Okay. Come on up. And so you're registered as Susanna Carranza. You are testifying on behalf of yourself and you're for the bill. And yes. be brief, we're due on the floor in 12 minutes. All right, and then I'm testifying specifically about the the issue with the apartment. I live in a high rise. I register people in on Rainy Street area where a lot of people live in high rise. Almost every other voter uh, miss the address, the, the apartment. And if, it, if I didn't remind them that they have to put an apartment number because I know they live in the apartment if they're in, on Rainy Street, they would have missed that spot because it's really easy to not see if there is not a box for that. Like the, the form is not simple. It's jumbled and it's really easy to miss information. So, so you'd rather I, see a slot on the form for apartment number? I see Or unit missing. number? Yeah, I, I, every time that I look at the, the voter form, it's like probably 50% of the time it has like, do you live in an apartment number? And it's like, it's here, it's missing. And if I hadn't pointed out, that voter would have missed that and their application would be rejected. And this is like me personally checking outside on a grocery store on Rainy Street, helping people get registered to vote. I witnessed that countless times. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any questions for the witness? Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify? Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on, for, or against House Bill 696? Uh, seeing none, the chair calls on Mr. Fierro to close. Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, members, uh, thank you for the opportunity. I close. Thank you, Representative Fierro. If there is no objection, the bill will be left pending. Is there objection? The chair hears none. The bill is left pending. Members, we need to go to the floor. Is there objection? The chair hears none. Without objection, the committee will recess until final adjournment or recess of the House today or during the period authorized for reading and referral of bills if permission is granted by the House. The committee.